There are many theories attempting to explain the origins of the Great Sphinx, and indeed its original purpose. We have, in the past, covered the compelling theories regarding an ancient celestial alignment to the Great Sphinx. Most popular among these alternative theories concerning the star constellation Leo. However, this theory is not only based upon events which happened over two precessions ago, but is also reliant upon the Great Sphinx actually once being that of an enormous lion. And although lions are mentioned in countless religious texts, ancient and also modern, with these beasts attributed to good deeds or evil, there actually exists another, and we feel more compelling theory regarding the Sphinx's true identity, purpose, and indeed its age. Since its rediscovery among the sands of Egypt, the Sphinx has been attributed to that of a guardian, long said to have protected the dead, and interestingly, this explanation may turn out to have been spot on. The Sphinx, although now possessing a human head, its form is noticeably out of proportion. If one indeed perceives it as a past guardian of the dead, and the underworld in which they dwell, then the Sphinx would have been in fact a dog, or more specifically, Anubis. Additionally, if the Sphinx did once indeed face a star in our night skies, then logically, there would only be one of two stars in which the dog would face, both held in high regard for untold millennia, one of which of course being Sirius, the other known as the little dog star Procyon. Interestingly, the star Sirius is held in high regard by many ancient cultures, some which insist that we were once visited by gods, locating from this particular star constellation. And with ancient Egyptian art drenched in mysterious beings, all attributed as gods who came from the heavens, it could be postulated that the Sphinx was guarding the entrance to what they perceived as the underworld or the realm in which the gods came from. What supports this theory and the possible concealment of this knowledge is the apparent destruction, and now absence, of any identifiable dog-like sphinxes left anywhere on Earth. Anthony West once brought the water controversy theory into the public domain, a theory he has done extremely well from. This evidence has long been used as a form of evidence that the sphinx is much older than currently claimed, and due to the absence of this erosion on the Great Pyramids, also used it to claim it is much older. Additionally, he has also been a verbal advocate for the belief that the Sphinx was a lion. Worrying, however, regarding his motives, if this were indeed the case, then any compelling connections with the function of the Sphinx, the entrance beneath, and the pyramids, each made to specific sizes in relation to the distance of Orion's stars, would be merely impossible to make. However, and what is most concerning, is that with a little research of ancient texts, it soon becomes apparent that the Sphinx was once surrounded by a body of water, conveniently named the Lake of the Jackal, or Anubis Lake. This aptly named body of water has seemingly been covered up, not only by West, but to attempt to conceal the Sphinx's real age, but also its true identity. This fragment of information not only discredits West's profitable rainfall theory, but also virtually confirms the Sphinx's past identity, and with Anubis being named elsewhere as the guardian of the underworld, it becomes apparent that we are on the brink of an explanation for its original purpose, no matter how astonishing. Throughout our time researching ancient antiquities, we have stumbled across many anomalies which, to this day, the questions we have raised regarding these sites have yet to be satisfactorily answered by anyone. How did ancient, seemingly post-cataclysmic civilizations accomplish such feats of ancient engineering? Not only are there countless ancient structures found on nearly every continent on Earth that are beyond modern capabilities, but the way in which they were liberated from the quarries and bedrock in which they were sourced, often many miles away, remains a burning question. Furthermore, the clues to these now lost techniques, the knowledge and indeed tools used to create these monstrous megaliths, the fingerprints of these now long forgotten activities still remain all over the hard granites once selected and used. 
No matter the geographical separation many of these sites share, it seems was not an issue, and they not only match, but as we have previously postulated based on said data, would appear to have been created with not only the same tools and techniques, but by a civilization whose tentacles far outstretch modern paradigms in regards to a single super-civilization having once been responsible for these extraordinary acts of ancient engineering. How can we continue to believe such sites were the work of academically shared, subsequently studied, in depth, and thus proven civilizations which we now know to have been incapable of such feats? The unfinished obelisk of Aswan, the megaliths of Yangshan Quarry, the polygonal astonishing feats of the mountaintop temples of Peru, and so on all share the same scars upon the weather-resistant rocks used in said structures. India, China, Peru, Egypt, and so on. Yet interestingly, different stone-cutting techniques are found upon different locations, yet seemingly coalesce within Aswan Quarry and other structures such as the Great Pyramids within Egypt. Diagonally cut stones, such as those within Baalbek and much further afield, are present within this quarry within Egypt. However, what makes the location of these massive pyramids special is that from the data, the evidence we have gathered, the structures were either built before said civilizations arrived and subsequently flourished upon our planet, but that these enormous structures were shared, possibly even an intercontinentally shared accomplishment achieved by not one, but many ancient super-civilizations which, it would appear, were even more capable than that of modern man. These butter-cut stones, such as the techniques seemingly used upon the abandoned obelisk of Aswan, are shared with many other sites, protuberances found within Peru and many other polygonal sites, are also present upon the pyramids, yet are seemingly much later additions. However, they are not only present on ruins around the world also. But the tool marks we have used to separate these sites are present within Egypt in abundance. The only other place we have witnessed such shared anomalies is Bazda Caves in Turkey, used by us to not only identify these techniques, but to pinpoint which lost civilization were where, and thanks to the pyramids, it would seem when. They not only share these marks, which are present all over structures across the world, but are only utilized in their fullest upon these two sites, so far discovered. Only shared at these particular sites and nowhere else found so far. However, interestingly, Baalbek seems to also share protuberances with other polygonal sites, but also possesses curious semicircular crescent-shaped tool marks across its biggest megaliths, as if a less accomplished tool than that used we would postulate later, after these techniques were mastered, as found within Aswan, Sacsayhuaman, and many other apparently more advanced ruins found elsewhere on Earth. Who were these ancient people? How did they accomplish such astonishing feats of ancient engineering? We not only find the pursuit of answers to such questions incredibly important to the development of our knowledge in regard to our origins, but is a quest we will always find highly compelling. The ancient ruins of Egypt, regardless of their astonishing characteristics or the often enormous megalithic building blocks used in the site's construction, are still claimed by an academia with no explanation as to how, as the work of our well-studied yet far more recent ancestors, the Egyptians. It is one of the most crucial ancient locations when it comes to exposing the conspiratorial nature of academia, a denial of the obvious by those who were faithfully tasked with explaining the origins of said sites, or indeed how said sites were created. Any of these long-awaited answers, however, remain elusive. For in reality, no one knows who built the ancient pyramids of Giza, how they did it, when they did it, or indeed why. We simply cannot explain how these feats of engineering and architecture were accomplished. For although such ruins are claimed as a particular group's work, 
there is no logical reasoning that can be provided to confirm this claim. Additionally, there are many other, no less gigantic megalithic blocks which can be found throughout Egypt, often found used within the many temples, but also seen buried, concealed within the foundations, which make up part of the floor at the pyramid's bases. And Dendera Temple is of no exception. We have covered the temple in the past, focusing on an intriguing depiction which many have come to conclude depicts a lost lighting technology. Some individuals have now created working replicas of this intriguing device. We have also covered the steps found within the temple. These steps appear to have been melted at some point in the past, rather than simple entropy. The temple, however, possesses many more inexplicable secrets, all concealed from the majority of Earth's population by a field of study that firstly lacks any demonstrative evidence, but also due to the evidence which one can mount to support the positive past stone-cutting power technology having once existed, thus these features are effectively ignored and thus largely overlooked. Copper chisels cannot explain its existence. People who have explored the temple have found that the repeating reliefs within are perfectly symmetrical identical in form to within millimeters of each other. The leaching of salts between surfaces are the only reasons we can see the joints in the Great Hall. Furthermore, Chris Dunn, a fellow antiquarian, has explored these intriguing clues within Dendera Temple previously. Not only did the precision of the carving stun Chris Dunn, but the finish upon such a brittle stone has led Chris to conclude that high technology was once utilized to create the stone carvings. Who built Dendera? What technologies were used to construct the temple? Or indeed, ancient Egypt as a whole? Dendera is undoubtedly a jewel in the crown, a now lost antiquity, one which we find highly compelling. There are many ancient mysteries still to be unraveled within ancient Egypt. And although they are rarely academically shared, the basalt floor found upon the Giza Plateau, being one such feature, located at the base of the Great Pyramids, possess some of the most compelling fragments of ancient advanced machinery anywhere on Earth, let alone Egypt. Additionally, there does indeed exist other areas upon the Giza Plateau that also exhibit these unquestionably compelling fingerprints left by an as-yet-not-understood ancient advanced technology. One such place, known as Abu Ghraib, is a place that many alternative researchers assert could have once been some sort of ancient stargate. Originally built as a sun temple, constructed to represent the ritually vivifying power of the sun god Ra, it was one of six temples built upon the site. However, only two have been identified. Yuzerkov, and that of Nayusera. At the base of the site, at the western end, an enormous obelisk has also been unearthed, which, according to experts, symbolized the resting place of the sun god Ra. The obelisk's base is a pedestal, with sloping sides and a square top. It is approximately 20 meters high and is constructed of red granite and limestone. Estimates of the combined height of the obelisk and base vary, although a number of independent researchers believe, when the structure was built, the total height of the obelisk was most likely somewhere between 50 and 70 meters in height, an enormous height and indeed weight for any of the currently attested ancient Egyptian builders to have worked with. But what we find the most intriguing regarding this obelisk, and indeed ancient site, linking back to the advanced anomalies located upon the basalt floor, is the enigmatic drill holes found driven straight through the heart of this monolith, and many of the other large granite stones which still litter the site, the holes undoubtedly completed using some form of high-rotation power tool. Clear, compelling evidence that whoever created this ancient work had access to astonishingly advanced technologies. Additionally, the site is also home to a number of enormous red granite blocks, each weighing in at several tons. Curiously, these massive blocks also exhibit the same uncanny precision cuts 
and extremely well-polished surfaces, which are also found throughout ancient Egypt and the quarries thereof. All once mounted into position with such incredible precision. Many investigators have concluded after visiting the site, just like the conclusions one is left with after exploring ancient Baalbek, that whoever laid these massive stones into position had an extraordinary technological prowess. Why does modern academia continue to deny such truths in favor of such mundane and incomplete testimonies as to the true origins and builders of ancient Egypt? How can we continue to be expected to believe, in the face of such compelling, overwhelming evidences, that these sites were merely the work of our more modern copper-wielding ancestors? It is undoubtedly highly compelling. The Terracotta Army Undoubtedly the most astonishing collection of carvings, whether mold-based or not, to be found anywhere on Earth. The artistic genius on display within this large terracotta army is hard to ignore when, according to academia, they were merely the handiwork of untrained slaves. Not only does the army display an immense level of detail and thus artistic talent, they are also all seemingly unique as if each soldier was an accurate recreation of an ancient individual in full armor. We have, in the past, covered this astonishing discovery, discussing how the temple in which this army is said to be protecting has supposedly never been opened, this even though upon excavating the original entranceways, sophisticated crossbows tipped with poison arrows were found left each on a butterfly trigger like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. Whatever these elaborate defenses were protecting has, according to Chinese authorities, never been explored. What's more, this same notoriously secret government have also made any future digs illegal, quashing all hopes for anyone who would like to know about this clearly intriguing section of history. However, these incredible features, along with the soldiers' average giant sizes, were not the only area of study we have explored regarding the army. In our first video regarding the amazing site, we explored the highly mysterious monoatomic pigment that was found on many of the statues, popularly known as Han Purple. This astonishingly complex pigment, although apparently sourced and manufactured in enormous amounts by a far less capable, more primitive ancestor, was not fully understood until the 1990s. A pigment that, according to scientists who have studied it, exhibits characteristics of, quote, an element of a lower dimension, end quote, and as such, according to mainstream paradigm, is an incredibly difficult artifact to explain. Yet, Han Purple is not the only incredible, highly enigmatic pigment dating from a now lost antiquity. There also exists another, no less impressive pigment which is highly likely to have originated within the now lost civilization we like to call the Pyramid Builders. Known as Egyptian Blue, this marvelous pigment was found during an investigation by the British Museum. The Parthenon Marbles, also known as the Elgin Marbles, are a collection of classic Greek marble statues, whose history, although heavily documented, display upon their surface not only evidence of an advanced ancient knowledge, most probably a leftover, still in circulation within top masons and sculptors around the time of the statue's creation. But this pigment, found during an in-depth investigation of the marbles, to discover whether they were once painted or not, was found in varying quantities upon their varying features, not only subsequently proving beyond doubt that the statues were indeed once painted, but like that of Han Purple within China, Egyptian blue also has a highly curious characteristic discovered by modern technology. It is not only the sole surviving pigment on the statues, but is only visible within the infrared spectrum, a band invisible to the human eye. Made under the supervision of the architect and sculptor, Phidias and his assistants, the origin of the pigment, however, just like that of Han Purple, is unknown. Where did the knowledge for creating this pigment come from? Why is it now lost? Why does it emit colors invisible to the modern man's eye? 
we find not only Egyptian blue's infrared characteristics, but also Han Purple's intriguing dimensionally deficient resonance as highly compelling. Many ancient sites found all over the world can no longer be explained away with currently attested academic opinion. Who they say built them, why, or when they were created. The most popular of these anomalies are the ancient monuments that can be found upon the Giza Plateau. Currently explained as having been built by our copper tool-wielding ancestors a mere 4,000 years ago, somehow successfully creating some of the most precisely built and indeed enormous ancient structures found on Earth, decidedly choosing to use granite blocks many tons in weight as their building material of choice. Ironically, although these sites are somehow exclaimed as having been built by the ancient Egyptians, any actual, literal explanation of how this was actually done has never been provided. Not only is academic opinion severely lacking any logical understandings as to the construction of these sites, they seemingly attempt to ignore, and in some cases conceal, additional controversial anomalies they simply cannot understand. Enormous stone megaliths are hidden all over Giza, and especially around the base of the Great Pyramids. And not only were these buildings adorned with incredibly hard granite, but also basalt, a similarly tough stone, and another which would be near impossible to have hewn with mere copper implements. Known as Giza's basalt floor, it is what many people now see as the smoking gun for evidence of advanced engineering having once been responsible for the construction of the site. Amongst the remaining fragments of the basalt floor is overwhelming evidence of ancient machinery, telltale precision signatures left on many stones, suggesting high technology was responsible for the shaping of Giza's enormous stones. Cut marks that could only have been left by high-speed disc cutting, striations, Precise ridges and countless other curious features have been thankfully left upon these stones, and these surviving tool marks could one day be used to actually identify the technology once used to build the site. We now feel that the evidence to suggest that the modern attested and mass-published theories regarding the origins of the Giza Plateau, its age, and indeed its creator's past capabilities, is currently incorrect and is now overwhelming, and that it is only a matter of time before a revival of this past knowledge and indeed understandings again begins to flourish. When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that to modern man escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded, 
due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stonecutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena, and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round-bottomed vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations, preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians but further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken, or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them. Along with the many other unexplainable feats, undoubtedly left by a highly advanced, highly capable lost civilization, there are the countless examples of extreme precision stone cutting. Not only is this remarkable past capability visible in their many stone walls and fortresses alike, but also in their exquisite artwork. If we look upon the statues of ancient Egypt, for example, the symmetry, along with the proportional precision present within their statues, is not only perfection personified, but unquestionably far too advanced for the so-called academically claimed builders to have achieved. According to the academics, along with their subsequent supposed accurate writings, these extraordinary feats of artistic perfection were somehow created by a group of individuals who were merely equipped with copper tools. Not only is this claim clearly ignorant of reality, but to create such works of symmetrical accuracy was unquestionably the work of a group of individuals far more advanced than even that of the Victorians, let alone those who thrived along the banks of the Nile more than 3,000 years ago. Not only is this precision present along the Giza Plateau, but it is also found at ancient sites all around the world. Masterfully created statues and structures, often carved straight out of stone bedrock, with such vision and artistic prowess that many now presume that the individuals capable of such feats must have had advanced machinery at their disposal. Most of ancient India, for example, is created with such delicacy and exactness that we today could only accomplish the same with the utilization of modern machines. Furthermore, many scholars and independent researchers 
even a number of highly recognized academic Egyptologists, have reluctantly concluded that many of the basalt, gypsum, and other vases shaped from extremely hard stones, and indeed a number of multi-ton sarcophagus lids, were indeed turned into the shapes we see them as today, on some kind of ancient, enormous lathe. This conclusion is made regardless of the fact that to create such enormous stoneworks on a lathe would have undoubtedly been out of the realms of capabilities for those who are currently claimed as their creators. Not only do the ornamental artifacts of Egypt and much further afield strongly indicate machined working, but there is also overwhelming evidence of these same machines reminiscent of modern stone cutting equipment present all over the world. Yet, conveniently, it is quietly ignored by the same individuals who have supposedly unraveled the history of these sites. Puma Punku, Giza's basalt floor, other areas throughout Giza, Peru, Malta, the list goes on. All these sites not only indicate an advanced, highly capable constructor, but also possess countless marks that, as of yet, we can only explain logically as having been left by precision, quick-rotation, stone-cutting machinery. They are yet another overwhelming collection of evidence, which not only flies in the face of current academic explanation, but proof of an advanced, now lost civilization having once been responsible for these sites' construction. They are highly compelling.